Okay, hello and welcome uh, back to the Stavos conference. And now I am very happy that we can announce the first invited lectures. And we have here together with us Professor Hans Martin Henning. Uh, he is director of the Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems in Freiburg, Germany, and professor of solar energy systems at the Institute of Sustainable Systems Engineering in the Faculty of Engineering, also at the University of Freiburg. He is a member of ACATEC, the German National Academy of Science and Engineering and spokesperson of the Fraunhofer Energy Alliance. Professor Henning obtained his PhD in physics at Oldenburg, Oldenburg University in 1993. And since 1994, he has been working at Fraunhofer ESA in Freiburg, holding several different positions and responsibility over the years. In 2014, he was appointed Professor of Technical Energy Systems at the uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, KIT, and in 2017, Director of the Fraunhofer ESA. Uh, his research focus lies on building energy technology and energy system analysis. He plays a leading role in the development of computer models for the holistic simulation and optimization of complex energy systems. The simulation results are used as a basis for investigations to develop national, regional energy systems with consideration of all energy carriers and consumption sectors. And what he didn't mention in his CV is that I re just read, uh, I think two weeks ago in newspaper, he is also now one of five advisors of the German federal government looking that our country is uh, achieving its climate goals. Uh, I'm very happy that Hans Martin is here and also have a bit a bad feeling about that because he postponed uh, his holiday. His family already is in holiday and directly after our invited lecture, he also will leave for his holiday. So welcome Hans Martin uh, to your invited lecture. The screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ingo, for uh, the introduction. And uh, thank you also for inviting me uh, to the Stavis conference this year, which unfortunately is in this virtual way and not uh, personally in Cologne. In the next 40 to 45 minutes, I want to try to describe pathways uh, towards a climate neutral energy supply. I will basically uh, do that for, for the example of Germany, but also have some a broader uh, scope in part of my uh, uh, summary. And uh, also I want at the end uh, talk a little bit about some major implications for global developments, which from my perception are very important in order to achieve, in the end, a climate neutral energy supply globally. So I will start with a brief motivation. I think everybody uh, is well uh, motivated and has a, has a clear view about the necessity uh, on reducing uh, climate emissions, but nevertheless, uh, the news which we can read in the newspaper almost every day are really alarming. Uh, we have all the uh, fire accidents uh, every year at the moment in California, uh, last year in Australia and in the rainforest in Brazil, but also in Siberia, uh, so in uh, much northern places. Uh, we have floods, we have extreme weather conditions, but uh, also a very clear indication on a very fast change of climate is melting ice on glaciers, but also on the ice caps, uh, in particular in the um, Arctis uh, in the North Pole region. And many more indications, even in Germany, uh, where we still live very comfortable, but uh, we have very dry weather conditions the third year now. Uh, uh, farmers are really uh, very, um, yeah, uh, um, sorry, <laughs> talking about, about uh, significant reduction of, of their uh, 
harvest and uh, so we can feel it everywhere the the important need uh, to do something on reducing climate emissions and uh, trying to keep uh, achieving the paris targets so on the next slide uh, i want to show and that's a, a global uh, a global chart uh, that the energy sector has a major impact on climate emissions so if we take together all these sectors electricity and heat production other energy industry transport and buildings and everywhere here it's uh, connected with final energy demands in these sectors they cover more than three quarters of global greenhouse gas emissions and uh, the remaining quarter is due to agriculture forestry land use land use change so um, in the next uh, in the further discussion i will mainly focus on the energy sector which doesn't mean that this is not important but it's not uh, also in the focus of my uh, research work uh, we are really addressing the energy system sorry that was the wrong direction i wanted to go here and first start with a with a global uh, view and i selected one of many studies which are uh, produced from many different stakeholders such as international energy agency but also the large oil companies like shell and bp are publishing scenarios and uh, many results are not so different from uh, from the different sources here i selected one from irena uh, for uh, from a study global energy transformation a roadmap to 2050 which has been edited uh, in last year and uh, shown here are three different scenarios uh, the so-called current trajectory which means uh, an extrapolation of the recent historical trend line of energy related co2 emissions and it's obvious that with this uh, we will certainly uh, achieve uh, temperature increases much higher than two percent for the reference case uh, current and planned policies uh, are taken into consideration also commitments made in national nationally determined contributions uh, with this reference case uh, the most probable temperature increase would be in the range of uh, 2.6 or higher and only with this uh, lowest one uh, shown here the so-called remap case uh, a temperature increase well below 2 degrees c the, until the end of the century is uh, quite probable uh, and this one includes the deployment of low carbon technology based largely on renewable energy and energy efficiency and for this last one i want to get a little more into details uh, on the next slide um, what we can learn from this uh, we still can reach climate targets which hopefully uh, have impacts which we still can handle um, but it's also very obvious that action must be taken now in order to get onto this trajectory. And what does that mean? We have here again the reference case, the yellow line, now not cumulative uh, emissions, but uh, annual uh, energy related emissions. All that, uh, as I said before, refers to the energy sector. So the reference case is the yellow one and the remap case is the green one where we can see we need a significant reduction from today on uh, of global CO2 and uh, other climate gas emissions. And uh, you can see here that the different sectors have to contribute to this buildings, transport, district, heat, power and industry. Um, and uh, the, there are three major uh, contributions or measures which help to achieve this and that's uh, electrification of uh, heat and transport so in germany we call it sector coupling or sector coupling sector integration uh, an increased use of electricity and of course this electricity has to 
predominantly uh, be generated by renewable energy. So renewable energy use in the electric sector, but also a direct use of heat, uh, renewable heat uh, or renewable chemicals in some sectors uh, contribute by another about 40% and energy efficiency in particular in the energy end use uh, contributes another 25% uh, percent. and if we would be able to uh, to change our energy system and to move uh, towards this line in 2050 the global emissions from the energy sector would go from close to 35 uh, million sorry uh, 35 gigatons, uh, billion tons in 2050, uh, 2020 today to less than 10 gigatons in 2050. So the key element for reaching global targets, uh, and that's quite obvious, we don't have so many alternatives, uh, is renewable energies, is electrification and sector integration and energy efficiency in the whole chain, but in particular at energy and use. So how challenging that is, can we see uh, at, from the example of Germany, but this figure looks quite similar for Europe and it looks quite similar for many, at least industrialized countries. Uh, here uh, we have the final energy consumption in terawatt hours for the four main application sectors. Uh, that's low temperature heat, which is mainly for space heating and hot water preparation in buildings, process heat in industries and transport. And then we have a number of applications where we traditionally already today use mainly electricity, such as artificial lighting, uh, information and communication technologies, uh, stationary uh, motors or engines are mainly electricity driven but also for instance refrigeration technologies so here traditionally we use electricity but in the other sectors electricity has only a minor contribution between 16 for the process heat five for the low temperature heat and just one percent in transportation so all our railway systems our metro systems our um, tram systems uh, uh, refer just to one percent of the final energy for transportation it's completely dominated today by uh, fuels and uh, mainly by fossil fuels we have some bio uh, energy mixed in our uh, fuel uh, but the, the uh, percentage of that is small and also probably shouldn't be increased due to other reasons uh, uh, competition of using bioenergy and so forth. So I don't want to go into more details, but we can see the very big challenge uh, to increase the use of renewable energies. And that has to be uh, by a large part renewable electricity in the transportation sector, in the low temperature heat sector, and also in the industry sector or in the process heat. So that uh, shows the challenge ahead of us. and. Um, I have been uh, working very actively in a project which is called ESIS, Energiesysteme der Zukunft, Energy Systems of the Future, which is funded by the German uh, Research Ministry and which is carried out commonly uh, by the German Academies of Science, Leopoldina, Akatech and Union of the German uh, State Academies of Science. And uh, one of the important chart, uh, chart which has been developed uh, in one of the big working groups of this uh, of this project shows a very rough uh, but the principal roadmap on uh, the four main phases of the energy transition uh, which we already have uh, have uh, passed or which are ahead of us so the good news is that uh, in the last 20, 30 years, we have developed many of the basic technologies which we need to make a successful transition of the energy. We have developed uh, 
wind energy converters we have developed photovoltaic systems also solar thermal power generation but also many energy efficiency technologies if we build a new house today in germany triple glazing is just normal and also uh, very efficient insulation materials are existing so we can build houses new houses at least today at almost the same cost which have a very high energy efficiency so a lot has been achieved in developing let's say the basic technologies uh, to make use of renewables and to make uh, an efficient energy use possible this doesn't mean that we are at the end here we have still a lot of good ideas how to make pv photovoltaics cheaper and more efficient uh, such as tandem systems uh, and so forth i don't want to go into detail so uh, this is not uh, finished this story but it allows us now to have really a large scale system integration of renewables. But that needs uh, many um, measures to be taken on a system level, such as flexibilization. I will show that later our paradigm of our energy supply uh, substantially changes. Digitization is uh, one important um, enabling technology to handle the millions uh, of, of single units uh, producing, storing and using energy in a more intelligent way and to have a safe operation. Uh, Short-term short storage will be important. And what we also see and discuss a lot in Germany, how can we develop the market, in particular the uh, electricity market, in order to stimulate a higher use of flexibility, a higher use of integration of volatile renewables. So that's the phase where we are now, but already the next one is clearly ahead of us and we are discussing it also in Germany in Europe and internationally that at a certain point, direct use of electricity will be limited and we need uh, also synthetic uh, energy carriers, chemical energy carriers, which can replace uh, fossil energy fuels in sectors which are dif difficult uh, to touch or to work with the direct electrification such as uh, aviation, uh, large uh, transport uh, and also many sectors in the industry and here large-scale electrolysis becomes a dominant technology also that will be shown later in a little more detail and we will also see later that Due to high negative residual loads, it makes a lot of sense to use these technologies, not only in areas where we have uh, much higher renewable resources, uh, like in the sun belt of the globe, but even in a country like Germany, it makes sense to employ electrolysis. I will show that later. And then we have the final defossilization, uh, defossilization sorry, uh, and here for a country like Germany, also probably import of renewables uh, by, uh, by electricity or by uh, synthetic uh, chemicals will be uh, part of the solution. And there is no need to be uh, autonomous uh, and not to also have a future trade system for uh, global energy. So with this, I want to uh, come to the next uh, part and get into more detail of this study for uh, Germany uh, and I will start with a brief methodology. Um, this just shall show that we cover the whole energy uh, sector, all the renewables but also imports and of course on the way into the future also fossil and nuclear still play some role. And then we have energy conversion and energy storage, many different options finally in order to uh, supply all the end use uh, sectors. So in this simulation, we try to cover the whole energy system um, and we have a, a, a strictly model based optimization, techno economic, economic optimization of uh, of transformation pathways. So one more slide uh, on how that methodology works. We start with a large database where we have uh, 
data uh, and also the stock age of all uh, systems which uh, produce or uh, convert energy, uh, uh, conventional and renewable. We have uh, buildings and the heating system, we have the mobility sector and the processes in industry and the tertiary sector because uh, we need to know uh, the age of all the components because that determines how fast a diffusion of new, new technologies can take place. And then we try to draw a picture for the 30 years to come on these sectors, but also on new components, uh, storage, electricity, heat, chemical storage, power to X technologies. So once we have drawn that picture, we make a simulation based on the development of this entire system on an hourly basis, starting from 2018, which is our calibration year for this study in hourly time steps. And then we uh, check whether with this, uh, with this development of the system, the CO2 limits have been met year by year. And on top of this simulation, we put an optimization of the development of the system in the future with a goal function, uh, which is the minimal cumulative total cost for the whole uh, time uh, span of the next 30 years, so for the time of the transformation of the energy system. So that's a model which can, uh, of course, not answer everything. We don't want to forecast the future. Nobody can do that. Uh, we also, because it's a macroeconomic approach, cannot describe business models for market participants or describe price building on the market. But with such a uh, model, with such an optimization, we can provide answers how transformation pathways can look like and the overall energy systems, of course, based on cost and performance projections for all potentially involved technologies. So we have a, set up a database on more than 100 uh, single technologies from a thermal storage through heat pumps, through battery storage, electrolyzers uh, of different kinds and so forth. And how from today's perspective, their performance and cost will develop. And uh, that allows us to describe consistent pathways into future and also uh, by the economic analysis we can answer questions what is the overall system cost including investments capital cost maintenance and operation and fuel cost for these different pathways and in the study which i will show the results in the next minutes we compared four different um, scenarios a reference scenario where we didn't have any further boundary conditions, a so-called persistence scenario where uh, the society uh, wants to use further uh, uh, um, internal combustion engines in the car sector where people persist to replace uh, their gas boilers uh, by heat pumps or by other new technologies, and also we have a lower rate of building renovation. Another scenario uh, considers inacceptance of large infrastructure, so resistance against, for instance, a further expansion of uh, wind energy uh, on uh, grid expansion, in particular high voltage uh, transmission grids, uh, but also, for instance, overhead line trucks on motorways. But we also considered one where the mood uh, or the perce perception of the society moves in a direction to be more uh, supporting uh, an energy transformation. I mean, if the thinking of Friday for Futures would really diffuse uh, uh, effectively into large parts of the society, this could result in a decline in energy consumption in all sectors and a larger uh, open uh, mind on new concepts, new technologies, uh, and so forth. So that's a so-called sufficiency scenario, and all of them are uh, considering a reduction of energy-related CO2 emissions by 95% until 2050. So now I want to show results, and the first one uh, is here, an analysis of primary and final energy in 2050. 
for the four scenarios compared to today's case. And today we can see that primary energy is dominated by fossil energy, uh, biomass, variable uh, renewable energy, that's sun and wind. And uh, still we have some nuclear. Uh, so overall in the primary energy demand, the renewable part is still quite small. It's much larger in the electricity sector where we are already uh, in the range of close to 50%, but overall uh, it's still be less than 20% and it's a large share of that is from biomass. And that's final energy, uh, low temperature heat, uh, industrial heat, transport and traditional electricity. So the same uh, structuring like shown on one of the previous slides. And now for all the scenarios here, we can see that variable renewable energy from sun and wind, at least in Germany, but that doesn't look so much different globally, is uh, the key primary energy in the future energy system. So electricity is becoming also primary energy. We use it also for producing secondary and tertiary energy sources, biomass, other renewables, and that's uh, environmental heat uh, used by heat pumps, but it's also solar thermal energy, uh, geothermal energy. And as all these scenarios uh, have still some fossil energy, they are 95% reduction. Uh, we have still some fossil, we will see later, that's mainly natural gas. And the difference between the uh, considered or uh, investigated scenarios is not so big in the composition. Of course, the absolute value is the largest for the persistent scenario, still a lot of gas boilers and uh, uh, um, internal combustion engines are used in, 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 in uh, transport. So that makes that the primary energy is larger and in particular other renewables are uh, used in a larger share. We will see more details later. And the uh, uh, most, the best one in terms of the needed primary energy, of course, is the sufficiency scenario. Another observation is that the losses in the system are much smaller from converting primary en energy into final energy. And uh, a main factor uh, for that is that we use much less thermal power plants, which of course have large waste heat losses. So for one of the scenarios, the reference scenario, the composition of electricity supply, which you can see uh, for today and then the development for the future. And uh, the main uh, lesson to be learned again is that wind on uh, offshore, onshore and photovoltaics are the key elements, not only for electricity supply, but also for primary energy that uh, was shown on the slide before, but they uh, completely dominate uh, the uh, electricity supply. Still, we have many other sources which are needed. We will see that later in, uh, in phases where renewables are not uh, available. We need these sources, uh, but from an energy point of view, renewable power is dominant. On this slide, I have uh, selected a week, a winter week, and on the next one, a summer week, in order to show that our system really changes dramatically. So here we have the basic electricity consumption, which cannot be further flexibilized. Uh, so that's the amount of electricity which uh, is absolutely needed. And that's the renewable production by wind and photovoltaics and a little run of river, which is contributing, but which is a very small contribution. Now, if we subtract the two curves, we get the so-called residual uh, load curve. And we can see here, we have only very short time periods where we have negative residual load, which means we have more renewable power than uh, our load which has to be covered but we have many phases where the renewables are not sufficient and in order to cover that we can use short-term storage such as that stationary batteries and pumped hydro but of course this is short-term storage so here we have some time where we can discharge it here we can charge it again and then again it can be uh, sorry everywhere here it's discharged and here it's 
charged. So uh, it cannot be used on these days because we have no renewables available to charge that storage again. So then we need a comb combination of a number of other uh, power generation uh, uh, equipment, uh, combined heat and power systems, combined cycle gas turbines, fuel cells using hydrogen and uh, gas turbines. So it's a combination of this and also that's a result of the optimization, how much the different technologies uh, contribute. But without that and also without uh, some others and import, it wouldn't work to uh, to have a safe and secure energy supply to each uh, customer in each hour. It looks very different in this summer week. We have, we have a plenty of renewable uh, energy or uh, renewable electricity by photovoltaics, but also here in this part of the week by wind. So the residual curve is highly negative. And now the question is, what can we do with this electricity? If we wouldn't have a uh, short-term storage but that helps only a little uh, and electrolysis and methanation and power to fuel and finally also export this and convert it to power to heat we are not able to make a good use of this electricity and that calls also for installing electrolysis and power to x technologies uh, in a country such as Germany, where we have not so much sun and wind as in other regions of the world, but otherwise uh, we wouldn't make use of the installed renewable uh, capacity. So this uh, underlines that we have a real paradigm shift in particular for the electricity system. Yesterday we had systems where supply completely followed demand and we have elaborated or still have elaborated energy markets to make that happen but tomorrow we need a system where we have a complex interaction of different actors using a variety of flexibilities including technical storage what we don't need and that's the first argument always uh, against so solar and wind we they cannot provide base power no, we don't need base load power plants. We have another system and we have to design uh, the electricity system and the electricity markets uh, to cope with this uh, new system design. So I think I have to fast up a little. Uh, there are many more results and I will go quickly through these. That's for instance, the heat supply in the building sector. Uh, I want to just show three main results of that, the, uh, we have a reduction of in particular space heating by uh, better insulated buildings. Also, we assumed uh, a growth of uh, the number of buildings in most of the scenarios. Uh, heat pumps are the dominant technology with the exception of the persistence scenario where, where we still have a lot of gas boilers due to uh, wishes of the population, of the people. Um, and also uh, heat grids are becoming uh, more important than they are today. Uh, so in particular in uh, these scenarios, uh, the share of buildings heated by uh, district heating networks is increasing. Uh, large scale storage is becoming important. That's battery storage, but it's also uh, large scale heat storage in district heating networks. Today, that's negligible what we have. Uh, and that will, uh, in all scenarios, increase to a value between 1,500 and 2,000 gigawatt hours, except for the sufficiency scenario. I saw in the program that later you will have a presentation from Denmark. We can learn, learn a lot of, from Denmark on how to uh, uh, make use of district heating networks and how to integrate large uh, scale heat storage in those networks. But also uh, power to X technology, as I showed before, is becoming important. And this uh, figure shows the different pathways, how to convert renewable power into hydrogen and uh, in combination with CO2 or also nitrogen uh, into different products, fuels, uh, uh, 
base chemicals for the industry and also for the transportation sector like oxymethylene ethers, uh, but also uh, direct use of hydrogen in fuel cell systems, gas engines and turbines and uh, if in the mobility sector and uh, uh, different other applications. So uh, that's one of the big uh, changes and the, one of the big technologies which where we are still in the in the childhood uh, to develop them on large scale uh, electrolysis and the subsequent processes for producing different hydrocarbons and other uh, chemicals. And uh, the electrolyzer capacity for the case of Germany, you can see here, it's in particular very high for the persistence scenario because we need much more uh, power to liquid and power to gas products uh, due to the persistence of uh, on uh, to, to to use uh, new technologies and but also for the other scenarios it's in a range of 50 to 60 gigawatt of installed capacity of electrolyzer so that's a really new energy industry which has to grow and to come up so the composition of fuels uh, for 2030 it looks very similar uh, like uh, today, um, and it's still uh, dominated by fossil. But for the um, for the uh, 2050, for the different scenarios, uh, imported and domestic synthetic uh, fuels are are becoming important. And still, we see uh, fossil, mainly natural gas, because of the 95 scenario. This would go to zero if we come to a 100% scenario. And uh, on the next slide, sorry, uh, we can see that, of course, uh, producing power to X uh, or power to chemicals, there are many places in the world which are beneficial compared to Germany, where we can come up to uh, 6,000 followed hours if we combine solar and wind, like in the very south of uh, South America or in parts of Central Asia or also of course in uh, in the Sahel zone. In Germany we have much less but nevertheless as I showed also here it's important to make use of these uh, technologies and in this diagram we see uh, how the composition is of liquid and hydrogen uh, synthetic energy carriers which would be imported the largest share up to a close uh, a little more than 500 terawatt hours for the persistent scenario and the smallest one uh, for the sufficiency scenario. Finally, let's come uh, to the uh, composition of the uh, CO2 emissions uh, in the different sectors, transport buildings, industry and energy sector. Uh, and if we follow the optimizer for the reference scenario, the final use of fossil energy is still mainly in the transport sector. So here it's uh, most challenging and most expensive uh, to transform. Uh, and uh, that can also be seen by the development in the energy sector. We have the fastest change, but also in the building sector. And uh, let's finally come to cost. Uh, um, and here we have uh, shown for the three decades ahead of us and for the whole time for the years 2021 to 2050, the CO2 avoidance cost, which we can calculate from our scenarios uh, for the reference persistence in acceptance and sufficiency. And we can see, let's look just at the average uh, for the whole period, its highest purpose. Uh, for the persistence scenario, close to 250 uh, euro per ton. Uh, the lowest is for the sufficiency with almost only 50 euro per ton. I mean, the range of this is quite well known. We also can see that it continuously has to increase. First, we harvest the lowest hanging fruits, which are cheapest, and then uh, it's getting more expensive per ton. But uh, we have to multiply that with the overall emissions, which are decreasing. So the amount of money uh, to invest for this is almost constant uh, because the specific price increases, but the amount of emissions decreases. So 
With this, I want to uh, make some final comments, which I find very important when we talk about the global energy transition. Um, I think on with the example of Germany, which is not the best country for renew using renewable energies, I hope I could show that the transformation to a renewable energy system is, is doable and also the cost is handable. But uh, what is really a challenge is that we need much more materials. Uh, uh, we need less fossil energy sources, but we need much more materials for all the converters, for all the components within the energy system. Uh, this number shows that uh, uh, even for our normal uh, economy, we increased in the last uh, about 50 years uh, the uh, metal ore from the earth crust from 2.6 billion to uh, more than 9 billion tons. And now for the transformation of this energy system, we need a lot of resources uh, starting from glass and concrete to uh, raw, rare earth metals uh, and so forth. So here I show for three um, for three uh, major components of the of the future energy system PV lithium yeah, sorry no, I had a problem here lithium ion batteries and wind uh, the 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 cost composition and we can see that material is dominant. Uh, and so the share of material costs will be dominant for many technologies of the future energy system, but also the avail availability of these materials. And for that reason, I see, Ingo, that you are already showing up. I'm uh, coming to the end. Uh, for that reason, I think that beside energy efficiency, material efficiency and reuse of components such as second life of uh, car batteries for stationary storage, uh, something we discussed today, what we really need is a full recycling, a full closed circular uh, value chain for renewables. Of course, uh, to initiate this transformation, we have to explore and mine it. Uh, we have to process it. Uh, but once it has been used and uh, all the components have come to their end of life, we must develop uh, technologies. Uh, we must uh, develop concepts and architectures also of the components of the devices to enable an, as much as possible uh, recycling of the materials in order to, in the end, uh, come to a closed cycle uh, economy not only, of course, for the energy sector, but uh, very much for the uh, renewable energy uh, system, because we need so much more materials and components. And that brings me to uh, a brief conclusion. So I hope um, I could show that transformation of energy systems in line with greenhouse gas emission targets seems at least in principle technically feasible that doesn't mean that we don't have to do a work a lot on on system stability on power electronics on many components on storage on power to x technology there's a, a lot to do uh, to bring cost down to uh, increase uh, performance and efficiency to uh, increase uh, duration and lifetime uh, but in principle, that seems to be doable and also to be, uh, uh, yeah, to be payable. Renewables energy uh, become dominant, not only in Germany, but worldwide. Efficiency and reduction of consumption is essential and helps a lot to keep costs low, I showed that, but also to keep acceptance high. Sector coupling, sector integration is a key uh, to, um, to, to, to achieve these targets and uh, the importance of electricity is significantly increasing. Um, we need uh, a full system integration of volatile renewable energy. So I showed flexibilization on generation, but also use side is becoming uh, highly important and storage technologies are uh, significantly contributing here. And finally, uh, I showed the challenges. Uh, that's uh, the 
resource efficiency and the circular economy. But also, uh, and we feel that very much in Germany, uh, to make that socially acceptable, uh, to take people with us into the boat and uh, also to develop the market frameworks. That's something where we have still uh, a challenging work ahead of us for the next mainly 10 years because our electricity markets need change in order to stimulate a higher use of uh, volatile renewables and flexibility. So I hope that uh, showed uh, on the example of Germany how the transformation could look like. And I'm uh, thankful for your uh, interest and I'm very happy on, uh, to uh, open the discussion and uh, respond to your questions. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you very much, Hans Martin, for that really interesting presentation. Um, we already have some questions in the Q&A section, and I would like to ask all those participants who already asked the questions to do it like Leo and Johannes Thema instead of Zoom, to raise your blue hands, because then you appear in our Zoom completely on top, and it's easier to unmute than your microphone and uh, webcam. Thank you. Then I would like to use uh, my position to ask the first question. What I wanted a bit was when I have seen the low temperature heat demand that will decrease, but it only decreases slightly. Uh, that means that um, insulation refurbishment of buildings does not play a major role? Uh, it does play a role. Uh, I mean, one of the interesting results, which we of course can discuss further, is that um, we would, uh, in particular, the building stock renovate to a level of uh, low energy buildings, but not passive houses. So that's uh, that's not cost optimal in the in the entire system. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have to also uh, take into consideration that for at least three of the scenarios, we assumed uh, a continuous increase in the uh, in the uh, overall used uh, ground floor for living. So uh, only in the sufficiency scenario, we had, a, um, we had a reduction of the per capita uh, area uh, for living. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in this scenario, uh, many other things are so more easy to uh, establish. So also in that scenario, insulation is not taken to the technical maximum, uh, but more to a minimum. Okay, thank you. Then I would like to ask Eva Maria uh, to unmute Johannes Thema. He has two questions. Yes, hello. I hope this worked and you can hear me. Um, my you. question goes directly in the same direction. Um, you said you assumed in the sufficiency scenario re a reduction of for example, per capita floor areas, I also saw that you reduced uh, mileage of passenger transport and so on. Correct. So um, do you have a backing up of those assumptions with policies? I think that's probably key because I've seen such assumptions in several scenarios and that makes an achievement of 100% renewables possible, but it's very seldom backed up by what is actually needed to achieve that. So that's my first question. And the second one is a very specific one regarding um, medium term or seasonal storage capacities. Um, there was one idea around for a possible alternative of using uh, previous, for example, lignite open pit mines uh, as storage capacities for pumped hydro. Um, and it's never been actually assessed or explored this kind of option. And we've just done a very quick assessment and we reached some 250 gigawatt hours for just a combination of, of three open pits in Germany. So whether you see this as an option there. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the question. So um, for the first one, um, let me come back. Yes, as you, you asked about political instruments to uh, stimulate an, another behavior. Yes, actually in this study, we, we didn't look at political instruments. I mean, I, I showed in the methodology that uh, that focused really on a techno-economic optimization completely. 
independent of uh, regulatory frameworks. But uh, of course, we need that. I mean, I, I'm, I, I realize very well. Um, I mean, one of the one of the probably um, most direct measures to stimulate that would be a CO2 uh, pricing mechanism, uh, which because the higher the price, the lower or the, the higher would be the motivation, for instance, to, at least to shift to another uh, heating system, because today heat pumps are, uh, even if we look at life cycle cost, uh, more costly than, uh, than gas boilers. Uh, but that's still not, and that could also push some motivation to reduce energy consumption. But I think beside that, there is a big um, potential of just changing mindsets and changing uh, behavior of people, which probably uh, has not so much to do with political instruments, but more with education, with, uh, with, with soft uh, things to better increase the sensitivity Activity of people on climate change. Uh, also, the things which we can now hear every day in the news w may have an, an, an impact on how people behave. We do, during Corona, we could see much more using bicycles, so changing habits in for, for transport. And so, I, I think there are things which are beside just purely political measures uh, which can have an impact and where I have some hope that that can further push a, a development towards uh, uh, yeah, making, making it happen. For the second question, yes, uh, you are right, the concept which you mentioned, but also other concepts like now we have this, I don't know, Kano battery, which is discussed in Germany, for using high temperature thermal storage in combination mm. with a turbine and maybe in combination in future even to use with a high temperature heat pump uh, to have another way of uh, converting electricity into heat and back to electricity. So there are a number of, of new concepts uh, which we are on the way to integrate in the model in the end, it's a question, at least in this tech, techno-economic assessment, of um, yeah, the, the the price and the the cost and efficiency, and of course also the losses uh, of of the storage. Uh, so I don't have a clear reply on how that would compete with, uh, for instance, in the long term, battery storage, where we also have a significant decrease in cost and uh, which which will also continue for the years to come but you are right we we should add more mm -hmm. components and that's uh, on the agenda for further development of the model while uh, the next two questions are from Mominul Hassan and while he is asking his question Ramchandra Bandari was one of the first who had a question but he didn't raise his hand maybe he could make it easier for us when he do is doing so. But maybe now, uh, Mominul. Hi, thank you. Thank you for uh, for the nice presentation. Um, so one of the thing, may, what I see normally, wh whenever I see energy system uh, modeling or carbon, carbon reduction presentation, I see rarely people talk about material efficiency. And thanks that you brought the topic as well at the end. Uh, so I was really happy. But uh, the, my my question was like, can we use urban mind um, to to meet the demand of materials in the future to produce energy uh, technologies? Sorry, can you repeat? I did urban mind. What? I, yeah, I, urban I... minds. For example, what we see like we our houses are full of tools and materials, and we just buy and throw it away. Yes. So yes. it's connected to the circular economy as well as you yeah. as you as you talked about in in the conclusion. So how do how, can we use this urban mind? Uh, all the materials we have, we are throwing out to produce these energy technologies in the future. Yes, of course. I mean, that was exactly the message uh, that that we should come. And, and of course, we 
the, the copper which we have to use in, a, in an electric engine for a car has not to come from the copper in an electric engine of a car. It could also come from other industrial uh, waste. Uh, so we need to develop these technologies not only for the energy sector. I just wanted to highlight the big importance because uh, renewable energies are infinite from a human point of view, but they are uh, very um, diluted. Uh, so we need um, l large areas and, and millions of components. Uh, and that mm -hmm. was my, my point. But yes, absolutely, I agree what you said. Yeah, I, I also see like that was like, I just saw like Bloomberg said that the wind turbines cannot be recycled and they are dumping in the, um, uh, in the landfill. Um, and uh, the, the graveyard of wind turbine is increasing every year. Mm. <laughs> so exactly, and, and that's exactly the challenge. And so we, we also have to um, enable recycling by design. I, I know a little better that for battery cells, mm -hmm. that's already uh, done. So the, the cell architecture is not only following a maximum performance, efficiency and so forth, but also uh, the, the goal to make it better uh, suited to, to, to enable recycling of it and to separate the materials after the time of use. How the policy point of view it can help us? Policy point? Policy, uh, like uh, can government can be stricter ah, okay, on material okay, okay. use? Yes, absolutely. I mean, all that has to be um, uh, covered by appropriate policies. Uh, otherwise, it would only happen once uh, uh, the the um, uh, new materials is getting so expensive because they are getting so rare. So, I mean, there is also an economic push, but I think that has to be framed by clear policies uh, because the, the availability of the material is not the only reason to do that. Also the landfill and the, 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 the waste which uh, uh, destroys uh, the, the groundwater or whatever it can do uh, is, is another problem. So uh, of course the, the topic needs clear frames uh, of policy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Then we continue with Ram Shantan. So hope you can hear me, Ingo? Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So uh, Professor Henning, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. And I have a, a question to uh, one of the facts that you presented. Uh, in one of the scenario, you um, wished, let's say, that by 2030, uh, the share of photovoltaics seemed to be uh, about three times compared to that of 2020. If we see it today, let's say roughly 50 gigawatt and three times would be in the next 10 years, uh, 150 gigawatt. It was in slide 17. Uh, my question to you is, I believe you are also involved in, in um, policy advising to the government and so on. So are you really optimistic that this uh, in the next 10 years, we'll have that much for all type market in Germany looking at the very, uh, unfavorable political trend right now? Uh, I'm a little more optimistic uh, in the last two or three days. I, I read an interview with uh, our ministry, uh, Minister for Economic Affairs, Peter Altmaier, just this morning in the newspaper. And uh, maybe the values are not yet uh, sufficient, but he made a very clear statement that of course, uh, we have no alternative to renewable electricity. And uh, now it seems that also in this ministry, they, they have realized that we need a significant growth of, uh, of both wind and photovoltaic uh, um, installation in order to be able to achieve our target. So that makes me more positive. Maybe in my new role, I can have <laughs> Uh, even an effect on also, uh, let's say, optimizing these numbers and having a discussion with the responsible ministries. But uh, so I'm, I'm not so pessimistic. The, the question is, is all that fast enough? Yes, we can discuss that. 
I would make it, like to make another comment at this point. Um, I'm even optimistic that we will get photovoltaic production back to Europe and maybe even Germany. Uh, but um, I mean, that was a very bad story of the 10 years ago or so, or, or eight years when, when all the photovoltaic production went to China and finally um, also, um, I mean, the last enterprises or in, in Germany uh, 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 stop their production of cells, but there are good signals that uh, it will come back to Europe. And one of the reasons is that we need a production capacity, which is at least 10 times larger of what we have today. Uh, today we have a production capacity of about 100, maybe 120 gigawatts in the world. And we need certainly more than one terawatt uh, in the near future in order to produce the PV which is needed to, uh, for the global uh, energy transition. And uh, of course, we need also much, much of that in, in Europe. And the production cost is uh, in Europe almost the same as it is in China. We could prove that in, in a number of very, very detailed studies, uh, also with manufacturers and manufacturing uh, associations. Uh, and so transport is even becoming more important for the cost of photovoltaic. So there are good, good arguments and we have contacts to a number of investors <laughs> which are planning also to reinvest in photovoltaic production in Europe. So, and also that is a good signal and can, can push uh, a larger use of that because also it helps our, our own economies. Thank you. We are running out of time. And nevertheless, we have two short questions. I think we can take them. Uh, the first would be Leon. Yeah, hello. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Cool. Um, Professor Henning, in the beginning of your talk, you mentioned a database of, uh, I think, components and infrastructure, including the age of that, which is very intriguing. I think, it, yeah can be very valuable in you, to your model. Can you comment on the on how detailed the database is? Should I imagine you, know, you have a, a bunch of power plants in there with efficiencies? Or do you even have all the houses in Germany and whether they have a gas boiler or a heat pump? Yes, we, we ex exactly have that numbers, of course, aggregated for whole Germany. At the moment we are uh, starting to disaggregate it to have a more detailed also spatial uh, distribution of that to consider that. That's not, not part of the uh, recent model. Yes, but we have a number, uh, detailed numbers of the stock of all the heating systems, even of the temperature level of the buildings, of the of the um, uh, status of an energy refurbishment of the building stock. And there are very good databases available uh, for the building, for instance, from Ivo in Darmstadt. So we didn't create uh, uh, research for or investigate for a new own data. We just took the, the literature available and uh, put all the data together into this large database for the whole power sector for the industry sector and so forth. Thank you. And then we go for the last question. It is uh, from Kukic. He or she uh, is not raising hands, so I will read the question. He or she is asking, what do you think, which kind of renewable energy technology is the best to integrate in district heating system due to get a low temperature district heating system? I don't think there is a single one. I, I, if we look at Denmark, there we can already learn a lot from. It's a mixture. So we will uh, continuously replace fossil or uh, uh, based uh, uh, heat generation by a mixture of different sources. Uh, and that includes solar thermal, that includes large scale heat pumps, which are using renewable electricity. Uh, of course, also in the future, and we can put, go into more details from our study, combined heat and power systems are still part of the solution uh, in the years 
until 2050 and even in the final year and then they are using either hydrogen or power to gas uh, products um, so also geothermal sources depending on the on the region might contribute and in principle also very interesting is industrial waste heat where we have quite a big potential and there are often legal and other contractual uh, 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 bottlenecks which which uh, make it difficult to use that but we also have good examples in Karlsruhe and in Freiburg I know from companies who uh, provide uh, waste heat from the industry into the uh, district heating system so it's really a mixture and that's one of the of the nice features of these district heating systems that they can help uh, urban energy management using different sources using storage and also somehow to decouple the electricity and heat uh, on, on, on the time scale. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we exceeded the time a bit, but thank you very much again for Hans Martin giving us the lecture. And now we can release you to your holiday. <laughs> and thank you also all the participants for the fruitful discussion and questions. Uh, and so I would like to close now this session for the invited lecture and for the next live event we will meet tomorrow at 11.30 again where we have uh, invited lecture from uh, Brian Bart from Denmark. So have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.